be here. And I have a, a few things to say about David, so I, I wrote them down. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to send a message from Ben King to the students and the chorus to please bring your laptops tomorrow to class. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he asked me to pass that along. All right, well, it's my great privilege to introduce Dr. David Stokin to you today. Dr. Stokin's curriculum vita will tell you all about his graduate academic journey. But his educational path act actually began at a premier liberal arts college in Pennsylvania called Susquehanna. Uh, his graduate story began at the University of Illinois where he received his master's degree and worked with Ray Waterton. It is not possible for me to tell you about David without also telling you a little bit about the people who mentored him along the way and the people he mentored. Ray Waterton was a truly extraordinary embryologist and scientist. Many of you may have used his wonderful atlas of vertebrate embryology, first written exclusively by Ray, and then shared with Gary Schellenwolf, another of Ray's students. It continues to be a critical reference to any laboratory studying vertebrate embryology, morphology, and patterns. One short aside about Ray, when lecturing, he could draw with one hand while he wrote lecture notes with the other, and Dave confirmed this for me last night. It was Ray who introduced David to the field of brain regeneration in a seminar class. And that sparked what would become an amazing career that is still producing so many important papers and ideas. David continued his graduate work with Charlie Wilde at Penn. Interestingly, Charlie Wilde has a link to the MBIBL. Charlie left his students behind, Dave, in Philadelphia and spent his summers here at the MBIBL where he contributed seminal work to the field of embryology, studying the mummy subfish, fungulus, with Dick Crawford, no relationship to me, although I wish there was. Uh, to, together, they were the first to employ a new tool at the time, a canine TV, to inhibit messenger RNA synthesis, and their studies were the very first to demonstrate the importance of maternal messages in the unfertilized egg a newly developing embryo. Charlie's photo is at the back of the auditorium. He also served as a director for the lab. So with this connection, it is a special honor to have David at the MBIBL for the inauguration of the Comparative Majority Biology course. David's scientific career flourished at the University of Illinois where he mentored many wonderful students. Dave rose quickly through the ranks to full professor and served as acting head of the Department of Anatomical Sciences. In 1989, he chose to transition to Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis as their dean of the School of Science. Uh, he also helped create and serve as the director of the Indiana University Center for Regenerative Medicine. He has made significant contributions to the field of regenerative medicine, and his book, Regenerative Biology and Medicine, is now in its second edition and is the fundamental reference for this field. Although Dave has recently retired from his position, <coughs> Review of, of his curriculum vitae reveals that his contributions to science and commitment to the next generation of scientists wrestling with questions of patterning in the limb and regeneration questions in general are as alive today as they were when I worked with him in the laboratory 20 years ago. David is a prolific writer with more than 120 scientific manuscripts to his credit with 30 just in the last 10 years, and his CV that he shared with me was three years old, so I imagine there's a few more. Uh, he's also uh, authored several books. My undergraduate students find his papers to be clear, understandable, and inspiring. David has mentored an extremely strong group of students, some as undergraduates, and here are only a few that you may know. Douglas Melton, yep, Doug Melton, who you will recognize as a, as a distinguished professor at Harvard and leader in our pursuit to cure type 1 diabetes, completed, his, completed and published his undergraduate thesis with Dave on regeneration. Ray Keller, University of Virginia, began his studies on amphibian gastrulation with David's mentorship. He is one of the world's experts on gastrulation in multigenetic movements. Charles Edenfeld worked with David as an undergraduate student as well and went on to study tears in development, first with John Trinkus at Yale and then Dave McClay at Duke. Chuck is a professor at Carnegie Mellon and world leader in our understanding of tears in development. Wong Sun Kim, uh, University of Seoul, Korea, 
completed his PhD with David, and David officiated at Ronnie Sharma's wedding. David Bergstrom, the Jackson Laboratory, MBI, completed his thesis with David and is now part of this community. A common element for all these scientists was that David was not, not only gave them free reign to study in the lab, but also gave, uh, but also became generous, genuinely invested in their lives. Science was not just a business for David, it was a family business. As my thesis mentor, I never doubted that Dave not only cared about the results I produced and the ideas we forwarded, but also cared about me. I developed pneumonia one winter, David came by. He encouraged members of the lab to check up on me. He watched and worried from a distance to be sure I was on the mend. I have a lot of stories like that, but perhaps my favorite was when he helped me buy my first car. I had never driven a standard shift, but wanted to buy one and learn. David spent a day visiting different car dealers, test driving every Econo car we could get our hands on. I did not have a lot of money. Um, while I sat in the passenger seat, and when my new Nissan Sentra came in, he went with me to pick it up and taught me to do what my father would have considered the impossible. He taught me to drive a stick. David has followed my career, cheered from the sidelines as I too came up through the ranks. So being of his lineage means being of his family. And with that, it is extremely fitting that on Father's Day, I introduce you to Dr. David Stoko, my mentor and very dear friend. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, <clears throat> it is a great pleasure for me to be here, and I want to thank uh, Karen Crawford and Voigt and Kevin uh, for having me here to participate in this terrific summer course on regeneration, which is a field that is heating up very rapidly these days and with one which we hope uh, will result in some therapies for serious uh, tissue trauma and also uh, diseases as, as well. Um, I want to thank you for that wonderful introduction because what it says, although she didn't say it, uh, one student, and she rattled off a list there, when what you expect is that your students will do better than you. And that has certainly been the, my case and she's one who has done much better than me, in my view. Okay. I'm going to play a little fast and loose with this word resurrection. And, but you'll understand what I mean by it when we get to the, uh, the, the right point here. Okay, this is going to be divided into three parts. And the first part is on uh, chromatin structure and differential gene expression. The second part uh, will be on resurrection. And the third part will be on regeneration. So here we go. We'll start with just a brief description of um, the genome, the nuclear genome, there's another genome, the mitochondrial genome, that's the small genome, this is the big genome. So we look here uh, at the cell with its cytoplasm surrounding a nucleus, and in that nucleus are chromosomes. For the human being, there are 43. Each species has a specific number of these chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of both DNA So what this diagram shows is going into the interior of the chromosome and just looking at the uh, DNA. Um, two meters of DNA packed into a nucleus of about half a cubic millimeter. Now that's tight. There are three billion DNA subunits. These are the bases A, T, C, and G. And you'll see here that they form pairs, T with A, C with G, and that's cytosine, guanine, and thymidine 
and the denosine. They bridge, these pairs bridge two uh, deoxyribose sugar backbones that are in a helical uh, twist. And um, these base pairs, these sequences of base pairs, are what form our genes. So a gene is, I'll use the term nothing more, but of course that's not true, but genes are stretches of these four base pairs, and you can get millions of combinations uh, of these base pairs. That's why we're able to have so many uh, different kinds of, of genes. There are approximately 30,000 genes that code for proteins, and we'll see how that happens in uh, a moment. Um, and this number is the one that I pulled off the internet. If you look in various textbooks, you'll see different people think that there are different numbers of genes. Some say 50,000, some say 25. 30 is good enough for, for me. Okay, now, differential gene expression. We're made up of a huge variety of different types of cells, from neurons in our head to keratinized skin in our toenails. So there are all told about 265 different uh, cell types in the human body. And what we know is that every single one of those cell types carries exactly the same nuclear genome. Yet, they express different sets of proteins that characterize each cell type. So the question is, how is it that all these cells can carry the same genome, and yet they're producing different suites of proteins uh, that characterize the function that they're supposed to perform? Well, the answer is, uh, that the genetic code, those base, bases, base sequences, that code is the same in every cell. What gives you, what determines which sets of genes are going to be expressed in different cell phenotypes is something called the epigenetic code, meaning above the genome itself. So the epigenetic code is tissue and cell specific. That's what determines whether a cell is a neuron, a kidney cell, a cardiomyocyte, or whatever. And the subsets of genes that will be uh, active are regulated by this code and the, to govern the degree of chromatin uh, compaction. The degree of chromatin compaction determines whether a gene is going to be on or off, and I'll show a diagram of that uh, in just a moment. Just to look at the, what are these epigenetic factors that we're talking about that overlay the nuclear uh, genome. Methyl groups <clears throat> and acetyl groups, by and large, although there are other things, microRNAs and so forth, but these are the two main things, methyl groups and acetyl groups. When uh, DNA is methylated, genes are suppressed. Any gene that has a certain pattern of meth methylation, uh, it will be off, and demethylation will activate that gene. For the chromatin part, which we'll see in a moment, is histones, um, deacetylation means repression, and acetylation means activation. So let's look at a diagram of this. Here's our two meters of DNA packed into this uh, nucleus. And the way it's packed is that it's wound onto octets of proteins called histones. And there are about 140 base pairs that wind around each one of these histones. And for tho those of you who know what these proteins are, uh, there are eight, of eight proteins. There are histone 2A, 2B, histone 3, and histone 4, and there are two copies of each one of those, A, B, 3, and 4, and that gives you an octet of proteins that's 
form uh, like a, a little ball here. So the DNA is wound around these histones. When the packing is low in, of the, uh, the DNA, the histones are all strung out. It, they look like beads on a string. And that's called uh, euchromin. So here we have histones being acetylated uh, and the uh, uh, DNA itself being demethylated. And this results in loose packing of these nucleosomes. That's what these uh, eight protein uh, structures are, are called. And that means that transcription factors, we'll see those in the next slide, can bind to the uh, uh, five prime end of the gene and the gene will be active. Here's the opposite. Uh, the histone tails are deacetylated and they're methylated and the DNA is methylated and this causes this loose structure to fold and there will be several levels of coiling and packing of those uh, nucleosomes and that determines that the genes the, uh, cannot be accessed by transcription factors and those genes are inactive. So this is the genetic code at work the methyl groups, um, the acetyl groups, and that's why you uh, get this, uh, this packing. So in a region where that's unpacked, where the DNA is accessible to transcription factors, here's how this works. Here's heterochromatin, that's the packed, tightly packed chromatin, those genes are silent. And here's the euchromatin, these are the active genes in the unpacked region and being exposed like this allows a complex of transcription factors, that's the TF, to bind to this five prime section of the gene called the promoter indicated by uh, P and this is like stepping uh, or pressing the starter button in your car. There is an RNA polymerase that moves this, uh, moves along the, uh, the, the DNA and copies that segment of DNA, that gene, into messenger RNA, which is this big molecule. That is processed a little bit to become the actual messenger RNA that is going to uh, code for the protein. Once that's done, the messenger RNA is translated in this little machine called a ribosome. And a ribosome consists of uh, proteins. Uh, there's a small section of the ribosome and a large section of the ribosome. And messenger RNA is like a piece of ticker tape being pulled through this thing. And as it is pulled through, transfer RNA uh, takes amino acids and adds them to this uh, it starts a, a chain of the amino acids and just keeps adding to them to form this linear protein. So proteins are made up of these uh, amino acids. Then when the protein, the linear protein is finished and has all fallen off the ribosome, it folds. Proteins are not active until they are folded up in the proper configuration. Okay, that's differential gene activity, chromatin structure, and how different cell types uh, get to be what they are. So here's part two, reprogramming the genome for reproduction and regeneration, or re and resurrection. Okay, so, um, these two guys, Rob, Robert Briggs, who was at Indiana University, and John Gurdon, now Sir John Gurdon, of, uh, who was at Cambridge, England at, at this time, showed that the epigenetic code of a differentiated cell nucleus can be erased. And the way they showed this was to do something called somatic cell nuclear transfer. Now, there didn't produced their results in terms of an epigenetic code. Nobody really knew very much about an epigenetic code at that time. But here's what uh, they did show. 
Okay, here's this frog, Xanopus glevis. Uh, it's the South African clawed frog. And this is how somatic nuclear transfer is done. You have here a differentiated cell nucleus. And then under a microscope, you've got a large pipette like this, which with a little bit of suction can uh, pull the uh, cell right up to the tip of the pipette. Then this very thin and sharp pipette is inserted into the cell and a little bit of suction is applied to pull the nucleus out of the cell. In the meantime, uh, eggs that have been taken from females are enucleated. Their nucleus is either pulled out or it's irradiated so that it can't participate uh, in any functions uh, anymore. And when uh, the, and then the, uh, different, the, the differentiated cell nucleus is injected into the enucleated egg. So this egg now does not have the genome of the individual that uh, made that egg. It now has the genome of this individual who served as a donor nuke. And so what happens is we know now that the epigenetic code is erased. That pattern of the fertilized egg. The per fertilized egg will have a certain pattern of methylation and acetylation, and that's erased. That pattern's erased, and then what the egg cytoplasm does is rewrite the code. Makes this different, the code for the differentiated cell nucleus, rewrites that code so that it's the zygote code, the fertilized egg code. And then what that does is here we have this at three hours. Um, is these cells, what I should say is that this act of injecting the donor nucleus uh, mimics fertilization in these eggs and they start dividing. And after about seven hours or so, they form a blastula. And this is just a ball of cells with a cavity uh, inside called the blastocele. That blastula undergoes a remarkable series of what we call morphogenetic movements to transform that ball of cells through several stages into something that looks like a tadpole. And that tadpole then continues to develop and after a year you get a frog that looks like that. Okay. So this was from a paper by John Gurdon, 1992, shows the results of taking wild type uh, fem female eggs, these will be the recipients, and intestinal nuclei uh, from, uh, to, uh, from male donors uh, to transplant into the enucleated eggs of these wild type females. Now, the donors are al albinos. They have no pigmentation, as opposed to this wild-type brownish-green pigmentation uh, of the, uh, the normal wild-type xenopus. So Gurdon did a series of these uh, transplants, and guess what? We get male frogs, they're albino, that proves that they have to come uh, this, this has to be a result of transplanting the, the donor nucleus. And they all look alike. But they're not exactly alike, if you notice. Some are bigger than others, for example, and there are probably other little variations here. That's epigenetics at work. Um, the code can be written with slight variations, um, and although you get Physically, the appearance, uh, the appearance of the frogs is all the same. They have uh, individual differences, and we know this in human beings as well. Uh, twins are clones, okay? They're just not made by SCNT. That's a splitting of the first two blastomeres of the, of the human egg 
that goes, they both go on to form identical uh, human beings. And twins, although they're physically very much alike and they have a lot of other uh, traits that match one another, nevertheless, there are slight differences in preferences for this, preferences for that, and so forth. They're not completely identical for epigenetic reasons. Okay, so this process that I just described is commonly called reproductive cloning. And we can do somatic cell and nuclear transfer the same way uh, in mammals. And this results uh, in an early embryo called the blastocyst, which was equivalent to that blastula of the frog that I showed you in previous slide. And this is a diagram uh, of the, the mammalian blastula, this human blastula, they all look the, the, uh, the same way. They're composed of an inner cell mass that lies at one pole of the blastocyst and then trophoblast cells that surround this uh, cavity. And this in the orange is simply like a vitellin membrane of the egg. Everyone in this room was at one time an inner cell mass. I don't know if you remember or not. <laughs> okay, now there are two paths that you can take to the blastocyst and two paths uh, thereafter uh, that are going to result in either uh, regeneration or reproductive cloning or assisted uh, reproduction. So you can make SCNT, uh, blastocyst by NC, SCNT. You can also get a blastocyst from in vitro fertilization. And then you go, you can take one of these two pathways, uh, reproductive cloning or assisted reproduction or regeneration by an inner cell mass culture. And this will be very clear as we go along here. I'll show this slide again later. Okay, so let's look at mammalian reproductive cloning. This will be done by SCNT, somatic cell nuclear transfer. This is the first mammal to be cloned, 1996, a very famous animal, Dolly the sheep. And these two guys did it at the Roslyn Institute in uh, Scotland, uh, Ian, uh, Ian Wilmot and Keith Campbell. And I remember in the early, uh, early late 80s and early 90s, when I was at the University of Illinois, um, somebody, a famous developmental biologist, came through to talk about this kind of uh, cloning, not about this, but he said, we'll never be able to clone a mammal. Frog, okay, but we will never be able to clone a mammal. And these two guys didn't get the memo. And they cloned this sheep, which lived to be uh, to the age of uh, six. Now you would wonder why, I can't help myself, I have to tell the story, but you would wonder why a famous developmental biologist is, would say never, we can never clone a mammal. And Natalie Angier uh, had the answer to that. She's the New York Times science writer. And she said, um, the reason why that he said this is because he's kind of an age, he was an aging scientist. She said, these guys go through something that she calls the philosopause. And part of that is they say, well, if I can't do it, Nobody can. That's how they think. And of course, there's always somebody younger that says, oh yeah, I can do that. And that's what happened here. Um, you can clone your pets by SCNT. And this is the first clone cat, uh, CC. The CC stands for copycat. And it was done at Texas A&M. Uh, there's a company that uh, does this called Genetic Savings and Clone. I think that's located now in uh, California. At the time, this, this cat was cloned, it cost about $30,000 if you wanted to uh, keep your old cat around after it had died. 
Okay, now here is where we come to resurrection. I'm calling this resurrective cloning. It's not just cloning your pets or um, something like that, but this is resurrective cloning and it's the science of de-extinction. So, as always, the movie people and the science fiction people are way ahead of the scientists. This is 1993, this movie, Jurassic Park, uh, well worth seeing. Uh, this is Tyrannosaurus rex, who's been extinct for 65 million years. And in that movie, uh, scientists on this uh, island got uh, mosquitoes out of amber, being trapped in amber, and the, they looked for mosquitoes that had possibly bitten dinosaurs and had dinosaur blood in their stomachs. They harvested that, the DNA from that blood, the dinosaur DNA, and stitched together a whole dinosaur genome. Now this sounds fantastic, but it isn't anymore because uh, Craig Venter, who has shown quite nicely that this is, you can stitch together a genome, but he's done it for a bacterium and added their own signature uh, genes to that uh, bacterium. And that, that was done quite some time ago, actually. And that's called, that's developed into a whole field called a synthetic biology. And so that's what these guys did in the movie. They performed synthetic biology on this. Once they got that DNA sequence, they put a membrane uh, around it so it was a now, a now a nucleus, and then they injected that into crocodile eggs as the surrogate mothers. Okay. Now here's another animal uh, that's been extinct for 10,000 years. And there's great interest in trying to de-extinct this woolly mammoth species. And a paper just came out by this group, Lynch et al. Uh, what they did was to examine the genomes, sequence the genomes of three different elephant species. And what they found was there are like 1,600 genes that distinguish woolly mammoths from modern day elephants. Um, we have the sequence, the DNA sequence of the woolly mammoth genome. So they compare the woolly mammoth genome with these three uh, elephant genomes. And the 1600 genes uh, is what distinguishes, the, at least at the gene level, the mammoth from the elephant. What was interesting was that uh, the genes that they focused on were thermoregulatory genes. So woolly mammoths lived in very cold climates. They're, these are northern animals. And they uh, have short ears. You can see that right here. Long hair, right? Um, they have high octane hemoglobin. Uh, a lot of fat under that fur, and this is what enabled them to survive in these really uh, cold climates. They would not survive in the tropics. Their cousins do okay that way, but um, these, were, these are cold weather uh, animals. Okay, so there's a great interest now in cloning these mam mam mammoths, and this book was just published in 2015. It's by Beth Shapiro. She's at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, this is the science of the extinction. And if you get a chance, read this book. It's, it's a marvelous uh, story that talks in serious terms about how this can be done. So here's plan number one to clone a mammoth. Um, by Akira Iritani in Japan and Russo Kwang in uh, South Korea. Let's clone one by somatic cell nuclear transfer. Why not? Mammoths, a lot of them have died and been preserved uh, in permafrost up in Siberia. So we'll just get some tissue that's extraordinarily well preserved and 
take nuclei from the cells, inject them into elephant eggs, um, put those bla blastocysts that are derived that way into the uterus of an elephant and bring a mammoth uh, to, to term. So the problem with this is that this team has not found intact nuclei in the well-preserved tissues of the mammoth that they have examined. Gotten the DNA, you can, the DNA is not degraded so badly that you can't uh, get a sequence. That's been done. But the nuclei are not intact. That's been the whole problem all along. And although this team, is, this team has been trying this now for five years at least, and they're going to continue trying it. But Shapiro, and I agree with her, says this isn't going to work. Okay? So, plan number two. George Church, who is at uh, Harvard in the USA, says, well, we can, don't have to make a complete mammoth. Why don't we make a partial mammoth out of existing elephants? So here's what he is working on, and he's made some progress with this. He, he wants to edit the Asian elephant genome. And the way to do it is you prepare Asian elephant skin fibroblast cultures, and then transform those cells to pluripotent stem cells. And I'll say more about that uh, later on. You differentiate the pluripotent stem cells to eggs and sperm. And this can be done. Then synthesize mammoth genes that confer survivability in cold climates. And these are the short ears, the long hair, subcutaneous fat, hemoglobin, and so, so on and so forth. Use those genes. The Asian elephants don't have uh, the, the genes that confer survivability in cold climates. Then you use the gene editing tool, CRISPR, to splice these genes into the DNA of the egg and the sperm cells. And then finally, you fertilize the eggs with the sperm, get blastocysts, and then implant those blastocysts into a surrogate elephant uh, mother or an artificial womb. And this has all been uh, science fictionalized before, first by uh, Aldous Huxley in Brave New uh, world, and also in the Star Wars movies, Episode Two, The Clone Wars, right? Again, they're ahead of us. CRISPR, what is CRISPR? This is all the rage these days, uh, just in a la the last year or so. Okay, so CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspersed Short Palindromic Reef I had to put that on this slide. I would never be able to memorize that. Okay, but that's what it stands for. It sounds like something you put lettuce into. <laughs> okay, so what is CRISPR? CRISPR is actually a combination of RNA and uh, protein. The protein is a nuclease, and that nuclease has the ability to cut DNA at uh, specific points dictated by the RNA that is, it is associated with. It was originally discovered as a bacterial defense mechanism against viruses and phage. Bacteria, believe it or not, get infected just like they infect us. And this system uh, actually makes RNA that attaches itself to in the sequence of the, uh, the, bat, uh, the uh, invader genome, and then uh, that combination, the CRISPR uh, protein, the nuclease, cuts the invader genome, and the threat is eliminated. So, CRISP, th this construct has what we call a guide uh, DNA, and you can, th through synthetic biology, can synthesize this end of the guide into any sequence that you want. So if you want to edit a genome, you need to target a gene. You need to cut 
that gene and then insert another DNA into that space. Okay, this is what George Church uh, wants to do. So Cas9, that's the name of the protein, the nuclease. So this shows the scissors of the nuclease cutting the uh, DNA, this part of the DNA. This is a DNA sequence that has been synthesized to match uh, a genomic sequence in cells that you want to cut. And once this is cut, there are repair mechanisms in cells in, uh, that want to repair the DNA. But what you do here is you stick in um, DNA from uh, another more synthetic DNA. Let's say this is the one of those uh, mammoth genes. Okay, and this is the uh, Asian elephant genome here. So you cut the Asian elephant genome, you have the donor DNA in the mixture that you're using here, and that is spliced right into the um, uh, elephant genome. So this is just called targeted genome editing. It's done in bacterial cells, it's been done in zebrafish, and it's also been done in uh, human cells very recently in China to correct uh, the gene for beta thalassemia uh, in human embryos. Now, the embryos weren't allowed to go very far, but they were able to correct the uh, thalassemia disorder, which is a blood disease. Okay, why clone a mammoth? You know, that question is going to come up. Why clone anything? That question should always come up. And Beth Shapiro gives a very good argument in her book, which essentially is to reestablish the cold climate ecosystem once occupied by mammoths and actually maintained by their activities. When you have extinctions, the ecosystem changes drastically. Passenger pigeons is another example she gives, uh, where they, they used to be here in North America in numbers that are in billions. And amazingly, they were hunted down by people, just shot. They were, shot, they were all shot <laughs> by hunters. And the last one died in a zoo, I think, in something like 1937. So you could uh, apply these kinds of principles to just about any organism that you wanted to bring uh, back to extinction, but you have to have a reason. It's not just do it. And you have to think about things. Do we have a proper environment now that we can put these uh, newly resurrected species into? And if you can't answer that question in the affirmative, you probably shouldn't do it. So I think she argues very nicely uh, for the reasons why. OK, part three, reprogramming the genome for regeneration. Back to that slide uh, again. So here's the blastocyst. You can use, you can produce it by SCNT, and then uh, that would be reproductive cloning if you let the blastocyst go to term. Uh, if you follow that, this particular pathway, if you follow this pathway in vitro fertilization, which I'll show you in a moment, we can go along this path or this path, here you, it's assisted reproduction, and here uh, it's regeneration by making cultures of the inner cell mass cells. Okay, assisted reproduction by in vitro uh, fertilization. This has been a technique used since the 1970s, uh, at first to great protest, but millions of children have been born this way to couples who can't have children usually for reasons that the fallopian tube uh, is distorted, uh, doesn't function properly, or um, the, a, a low sperm count uh, that you have to, in some way, concentrate uh, that in order to fertilize an egg. So this is how that's done. Um, egg maturation is, in the ovary is stimulated by hormonal stimulation. The eggs 
are uh, removed um, by laparoscopy or transvaginally, and then the eggs are fertilized in vitro with a concentrated solution of the most active sperm. Blastocysts, it takes about five days to, for those uh, fertilized eggs to divide to blastocyst. Three of them are then transferred, up to three, into the, the, uh, the uterus. And usually there are many more blastocysts than uh, get used in this procedure, so they're stored uh, frozen. And once the uh, a couple's reproductive aspirations uh, have been achieved, then these blastocysts, these remaining blastocysts, can be used for research purposes uh, given their consent. Okay, so this guy, Jamie Thompson. 1998, he made the first human embryonic stem cell cultures. And the way he did it was to take the blastocyst, isolate the uh, inner cell mass, dissociate the inner cell mass cells, and then culture them on human feeder fibroblasts or on some kind of uh, adhesive uh, substrate. And so you get these colonies of uh, embryonic stem cells. They look like this. Um, we are now able to actually derive human embryonic stem cells uh, by uh, SCNT. And this has been tried a number of times in the standard way where you enucleate an egg, a human egg, and then uh, transplant a diploid nucleus into the egg to mimic the act of fertilization. These, blast, the, these embryos, early embryos, would get to like a six to 10 cell stage. And then they would undergo growth arrest and die. And just recently, in 2013, Metalopov uh, et al. discovered that if you leave the egg nucleus in when, and then transplant, transplant the diploid nucleus of the don donor, you now have a triploid cell, a cell with three sets of chromosomes instead of the normal two, but uh, this will form a blastocyst. So that tells us that the egg nucleus uh, is still in, is necessary to produce certain kinds of factors that can ensure the survivability of this uh, dividing egg. Now, the next step is going to be to take this inner cell mass, like I showed you in the previous uh, slide, and then grow this up as an embryonic stem, uh, stem cell culture, okay? So that, can, that has not been done yet for reasons that will become clear in a moment because we actually have a better way to uh, do this. There are a lot of bioethical objections to human embryonic stem cell research, and particularly to doing uh, research on cells that have been derived by SCNT. So here's the, here are the arguments. The one is that the fertilized egg is genetically uh, distinct, uh, and therefore it has the moral right uh, of existence or personhood. And unlike an adult, the embryo cannot consent to or refuse anything. So its moral right to exist has to be protected by society. Some people believe that destroying the embryo, the blastocyst, is abortion, and others even believe that it's murder. And there's this feeling that this research opens the way to a totally utilitarian uh, and humanizing, dehumanizing society that will destroy the dignity of uh, human life and lead to crimes against humanity. That, I think, is an extraordinarily weak uh, argument. Uh, we've been committing crimes against humanity since we came down out of the trees. There's a particular bioethical concern about SCNT human ESCs because this is creating a potential human life by nuclear transfer and then destroying that life for a selfish purposes. 
Now, with the exception of this one, I think all of these are very serious arguments that have to be taken into consideration. The counter argument is, does the fact that we have so many people who suffer from this disease or that disease that could possibly be cured by uh, cells, transplanting cells from these uh, SCNT embryos. Shouldn't we do that? Because after all, a five-day-old blastocyst um, is just a ball of cells. I once participated um, with a bioethicist in a debate with uh, a religious uh, leader and I was kind of stunned at the language they used to describe how uh, these, um, yes, how embryonic stem cells are made. And the descriptions are such that they refer to the blastocyst as a baby, which it is not. It's very far removed from, from that. And they describe the procedure as tearing the blastocysts uh, out of a woman and then tearing the inner cell mass from within the blastocyst. This is language that's calculated to make people horrified. And that's why it's extremely important to have enough scientific literacy to understand what is actually being done here and why. While at the same time, paying attention to these bioethical objections. Okay, I'll say one more thing about that in a moment. This actually was bypassed. These objections have been bypassed now. In 2007, uh, when two teams, one uh, headed by Shinya Yamanaka at Kyoto University in Japan, and another headed by uh, James Thompson, who we just saw on a previous slide at the University of, of Wisconsin. And what they did was to create the equivalent of embryonic stem cells from fibroblasts of the skin. And here's how they did it. They used a combination of transcription factors uh, that they loaded into retroviral vectors and then infected skin fibroblasts with those constructs. Yamanaka's group used these four. These are transcription factors that are known to be involved in maintaining pluripotentiality, which is a feature of embryonic stem cells. That means that they can differentiate into any cell type of the body. After all, that is where all our cell types come from uh, anyway. So they used these, uh, these four uh, transcription factors. And James Thompson's group used two of those same four, but then two different ones called LIN28 and NANOG. Um, the fact that they were able to do this, they would not have been able to do this had we not been studying embryonic stem cells first, because we would not have known what transcription factors to even try in order to make these uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, as they called them. They did a comparative analysis between bona fide uh, human embryonic stem cells uh, with the iPS cells, and they're very similar in their morphology, their gene expression profile, their epigenetic status, methylation, acetylation, uh, how they're able to, what kind of cell types they're able to differentiate into uh, in, in vitro, and also their ability to form teratomas. This is a significant test. They inject these cells into uh, a leg muscle and then uh, in that environment, they should be able to, if they're truly pluripotent, they should be able to uh, form uh, what we call uh, all of the cells from all of the three embryonic uh, germ layers, and they can do that. So they're very much alike, these iPS cells and ES cells. So here's John Gurdon again. Uh, Yamanaka and Gurdon uh, received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine uh, in 1912 um, for the discovery that um, mature cells can be reprogrammed to become pluripotent. 
Uses of these cells are many. Uh, our interest is differentiated derivatives for tissue replacement. You, know, you need some new heart cells, okay. We'll differentiate them from your own cells. We can make your own designer iPSCs by just taking some skin cells from you and then making the stem cells and then making new heart cells, kidney cells, anything you want. You can study disease onset and progression. Uh, this is the disease in a dish uh, concept. Uh, you can screen molecules and compounds for their ability to suppress disease characteristics and disease progression, for example, diabetes, and in particular, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, which are the focus of a lot of the work that's being conducted today. And you can study early events of embryonic development that are very difficult to study in utero uh, by this disease in a dish principle. Okay, so Dr. Crawford mentioned this guy, Doug Melton. He was an undergraduate student with me at the University of Illinois, and he's another example of one student doing better uh, than you have. He's a chaired professor at Harvard, and he's in the um, uh, stem cell uh, institute there. He has two kids, both of whom have type 1 diabetes. He switched his research program. He was very interested in frog development, developmental biology. He switched from that to research on diabetes. And he has now, after 10 years, come up with a protocol to derive functional beta cells, the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas, from either human embryonic stem cells or human-induced uh, pluripotent stem cells. The protocol takes four or five weeks to generate these cells. Eleven different factors have to be fed to these cells. Proteins, lipids, and sugars uh, does not involve inserting any genes into the genome. The beta cells secrete adequate amounts of insulin and, most important, they are glucose responsive. So these are real candidates for being able to replace beta cells uh, in uh, a pancreas, if, with one exception. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder, and you've got to find a way uh, to prevent these cells from being attacked once they are given to a person. So that means taking immune rejection drugs, but better yet, to have a parallel line of inquiry, which is going on, on how to render the body tolerant, our own immune system tolerant, to cells that are grafted uh, this way. IPSCs, uh, it would sound like, well, doesn't that deal with that? These are your, your own cells. But uh, the autoimmune problem is still there, and those cells would be attacked uh, as well. Okay, now we're going to turn to natural born reprogrammers, uh, something that um, the lab here is definitely uh, involved with. So, this is a full grown uh, axolotl. This, my favorite, is the uh, larva of uh, Ambystema uh, maculatum, the eastern spotted uh, salamander. Uh, these are plethodontid salamanders, which, and this is uh, a newt, uh, not a thalamus viridescens, eastern uh, newt. All of these characters can regenerate limbs, and the newt can actually regenerate the lens of its eye as well. And various other tissues in these animals will regenerate as well, heart, parts of the brain, spinal cord. So they're wonderful uh, animals to study to try to learn the secrets of regeneration. This is from uh, James Monahan at Northeastern University. I love this uh, photo. It's, it's just a, a wheel. The center of it represents uh, uh, a, an array of genes that uh, 
he, he has been investigating in his lab, and it shows uh, the gross stages of regeneration of an axolotl limb starting here at amputation. And what happens is this mound of cells grows out, a uh, conical mound of cells, it lengthens, and then it starts to redifferentiate into the uh, tissues that were lost. So here you see three little finger buds emerging. Here they are bigger. Now uh, those three are well along, and this one has started to grow. And we go around until eventually the limb uh, is right back where it started, except that now the animal is a little bit bigger because these animals are growing all the time. This is the, what goes on inside the limb. Uh, this is a limb in an axolotl that was amputated right through the very distal uh, radius and ulna of the forearm. And we see here four days after the amputation, these very darkly staining cells are accumulating under this thickening epidermis at the tip of the limb. These are the so-called blastema cells. They arise by dedifferentiation of the uh, uh, differentiated tissue here, but also from stem cells that are in the muscle and probably also in the connective tissue layer that surrounds the bones. These cells divide. Uh, they're not, at this point, at four days, remember nerves are cut when you amputate these limbs. The nerves have to start growing in, and uh, eventually, just a little bit after this particular stage of development, the nerves reach this thickened epidermis, which we now call the apical epidermal cap. And uh, that cap produces a protein called anterior gradient protein. And that anterior gradient protein binds to a receptor on the surface of the blastema cells called prod one, and stimulates these cells now to divide at this stage. And that's why, you see, at the result of that, you see here, the blastema is now much bigger. Due to that cell division, this between this, uh, due to the, which in turn is due to this uh, circuit between the nerve and the uh, apical epidermal cap. Here's nine days. You now see this is starting to redifferentiate into the lost parts. And by three weeks, you have this nicely uh, reconstituted limb that is totally functional. And by contrast, we have, we're back to our frog again, Xenophus levis. This is a regeneration deficient uh, animal. And if you look at these tadpoles, Karen has some up, up in the lab here. If you look at these tadpoles, here is this tiny uh, rim bud. This is, here it is blown up. At an early tadpole, you can cut this limb off and it will regenerate perfectly, right? But by the time the limb actually starts differentiating, uh, sometime later, and at the adult stage, if you cut the limb off, all you get, you get a blastema. It's a, called a fibroblastema. It's not the same as the one you see in the axolotl. It looks the same on the outside, but it isn't. It turns into this. And inside this, all you have is a spike of cartilage surrounded by connective tissue. Okay, so, Nandini Rao in my lab um, did a proteomic analysis comparing the Xenophus fibroblastema uh, with blastema formation in the axolotl. The axolotl data was published in 2009. This was published in 2014. What did we find here? What's different about the Xenophus from the axolotl? Well, for one thing, there's a deficiency in this early signaling pathway uh, that produces inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol, which are central to a lot of biochemical interactions that uh, 
uh, reactions that go on in um, cells. There's down regulation of a signaling molecule called Wnt, which is prominent in the axolotl. There's up regulation of extracellular matrix proteins, which makes it very hard to digest uh, around the cells to release them to become blastema cells. There is early upregulation of proteins that stimulate chondrocyte differentiation, which is one of the reasons why we get that spike. Um, there are dorsalizing proteins that we don't see in the axolotl that make this limb, this spike, symmetrical. There's hypermethylation of sonic uh, a molecule called sonic hedge hedgehog that um, uh, the enhancer for that, the gene for sonic hedgehog, that leads to lack of expression of that gene. That gene is very important in getting the kind of anterior to posterior asymmetry that we see in our own hand going from the thumb to the little finger. Um, that's uh, Koji Tamura's group in Japan that's done that work, and they also have done this work. Uh, they're patterning genes called the HOX-A genes, uh, that are supposed to separate from one another as the blastema grows, they fail to do that uh, in this regenerating uh, xenopus limb. And there are other things here. AGP hasn't been looked for. Uh, there are, there's proton uh, efflux and sodium influx. That hasn't been looked at, and nothing has been done in this animal looking at various kinds of reprogramming factors. So, can we enhance the regeneration of regeneration deficient limbs? So, here's how a lot of us think that if we just assume that regeneration is an evolutionary ancestral feature, that's just been turned off in, in humans, but it's still there, okay? All we have to do is figure out how to activate the genes that comprise uh, that, that feature. After all, as we showed you, I showed you here, Xenopus tadpole limbs can regenerate perfectly. It's only when they become differentiated that they now fail to uh, regenerate. So the, the genetic features to do this, we think, must be present somehow. Okay, so all we have to do is identify the signaling factors that are responsible for axolotl limb regeneration and apply them to amputated Xenopus limbs. So, Xiaoping Chen in my lab uh, recently, over the last three years, performed some of these studies. Uh, first, a simple experiment to try to improve Xenopus hind limb regeneration with grafts of axolotl limb tissues. And the idea was the Xenopus immune system will attack the grafted tissues. The tissues will be destroyed, but the proteins that are responsible for axolotl limb regeneration will be released and cause regeneration of the uh, Xenopus limbs. So here's the control. This is the spike, right? But look at this. Two digits after amputating limbs with these grafts, and here's one that is forming three digits. She looked for expression of one of these proximal distal patterning genes, HOXA13, in a, this two-digit Xenopus limb, and sure enough, um, it's expressing that, uh, that gene. That gene, HOXA13, is associated with digit formation. And this, is, this, this slide shows um, blood. This, this was the result of grafting tissues from a GFP, green fluorescent protein axolotl, to the xenopus. And she looked at, for blood cells, and she can uh, find them, uh, probably because they came from the bone marrow and survived, of the axolotl bone marrow and survived in, in xenopus. And in the next slide, she stained with MF20, which is uh, uh, antibody uh, to a protein that you find uh, exclusively in muscle. And what this looks like is that there are at least some strands of muscle that have formed in these limbs. 
Then she did the reverse experiment. She grafted xenopus tissue into axolotl to see if that would be, if the regeneration would be inhibited, and it is to various degrees. This one, uh, two digits form. Here, uh, one complete, two complete digits, and then a very short one, and then this one, uh, just a few thready looking uh, fingers. So, it seems proof of principle that this can be done, and I should mention uh, Gufa Lin at the University of Minnesota with Jonathan Slack performed a similar kind of experiment, but what they did was to graft cells, xenopus cells, uh, cells from the early xenopus tadpole into late stage xenopus tadpoles, which only regenerate a spike, and they got similar kinds of um, results. Okay, so it'd be very nice. Now, the next step in that set of experiments would be to do protein extracts from the axolotl limbs and the xenopus limbs and just inject them without the tissues. We haven't done that yet. Okay, but that assumption that regeneration deficient limbs have the latent genetic capability to regenerate might well be wrong. And that comes from studies by Jeremy Brox in England on this gene called PRIDE1, which I've mentioned already, that is the receptor for this AGP pro, uh, protein from the apical epidermal cap, and that causes mitosis. It also links mitosis with patterning, but um, that's a, a much longer story. What's interesting is the evolutionary survey he did. Can we find PRIDE1 in uh, other animals that we suppose just have their genetic machinery for regeneration turned off? Or is it missing? Are we missing something? He finds in this survey that PROD1, he looked for PROD1, is unique to uroteals. It isn't found in any other uh, species of amphibian, including xenopus, just in the uroteals, which are the only ones that can regenerate. And uh, Thomas Brown's laboratory in Germany uh, did a recent proteomic analysis of newt limb regeneration, revealed several hundred newt-specific uh, proteins that could be correlated with regeneration, although we don't really know that. So the bottom line here is that local evolution may have conferred perfect limb regeneration on uroteals alone. There is no ancestral regeneration system uh, that we all might have. So what about regenerating the mammalian limb? Can we do it? Is there any reason to believe that we can? Yes. Uh, I want to go back to George Church. Here's how we do it. We sequence the axolotl genome, and that's ongoing by uh, Randall Voss at the University of, of Kentucky. We edit unique regeneration genes, say from the axolotl, into the genome of cultured xenopus limb fibroblasts, and implant those cells into the xenopus limb, and then amputate. Will it regenerate? If that's successful, edit the same genes into the genome of cultured mouse, rat, or even human limb fibroblasts and transplant those to amputated limbs and see if we can make that limb uh, regenerate. And this is what you would get. <laughs> okay. Um, and my apologies to Lauren Isley, uh, his, his story, The Dance of the Frogs, which I, if you want to know more about that, because it's quite an interesting story, I'll tell you after we're done here, which we almost are. Okay, now, here's another idea. Using acellular scaffolds to replicate limb structure. And this is a recently published uh, press release, I think, by Harold Ott at Massachusetts uh, General 
hospital. What you see over here, this is a rat limb. It's been decellularized with detergent. So all that's left behind is the extracellular matrix scaffold and the blood vessels in that limb. And he then reseeded um, this uh, limb with uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And they differentiated into new muscle, new, new bone. And he said they stimulated the limb and it clenched its digits like this. Um, he did the same thing with a monkey limb. And I am hoping that he obtained this from a dead monkey because, believe me, I would never approve chopping a limb off a live monkey for purposes of an experiment like this. There are some things you just should not do. But he said the same thing. Here you see the monkey's fingers clenching into a fist. That he decellularized that and then injected uh, cells back in. Okay, now, if you can do that, it isn't really, I don't think, necessary that you have a natural matrix in order to do this, this kind of work. And here's where the polymer chemists and others come in. If you can take these limbs and digitize the extracellular matrix in 3D, okay, um, you can build, I think, theoretically, you can build scaffolds out of the kinds of polymers that we know about today and then seed those scaffolds uh, with cells and then uh, get them to differentiate into the different types of tissues of the limb and then you graft that limb uh, in place of the missing limb, that limb can be, will become innervated because the peripheral nerves can regenerate back into tissue. So that's what I would like to, uh, I think that is an, uh, a direction worth exploring. Um, Three-dimensional printing is another way to go. This is getting more and more sophisticated using cells as the ink and extracellular matrix as the paper. Uh, if we fail in the end, the engineers will rescue us, okay? You've all heard of a little two-wheeled vehicle called a seg Segway, okay? So that those were designed by an inventor named Dean Kamen who has uh, a lab in New Hampshire. He was awarded a grant from DARPA um, and to develop uh, an artificial limb that could be hooked up to the nerve stumps in the case of uh, amputations. And this is the version of that uh, limb. You can see that this guy drinking out of a bottle of water. I saw another one where he plucks a grape and sticks it in his mouth. Uh, this thing is kind, it's really kind of exquisite, exquisite piece of engineering here. Um, they call it Luke after Luke Skywalker. If you remember the Star Wars movie, uh, Darth Vader slices his arm off and he gets a, a new one uh, like that. So that may be uh, the ultimate in uh, what we can uh, look forward to. Okay. Um, the universe is the limit, and that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my question would be, you showed some examples of severed limbs in different ways. They call it maybe a cast, a closed cast. Yes. Well, that, that's a fantastic question, and I have to say, we don't know. <laughs> yes, there is definitely some feedback mechanism going on there that stops that at the proper point. Maybe it's counting mitotic divisions, uh, possibly. Uh, maybe it's reaching 
a certain stage of differentiation. Um, so you just look but at we that don't know. protein trade again. Yeah. Maybe that's there in the beginning, and as it reaches maturity, that protein disappears. Very possible, yes. And would that be the same for fish, salamanders, human, etc., or did these creatures all reinvent different ways of regeneration? I find it hard to believe that they've all reinvented it, but uh, the eye has been invented several times over the course of evolution, so it's possible that they did just that, uh, that the inventions came up uh, in response to local selective factors, uh, and we don't really know the answer to that question. The way to do it, this lab here is in a perfect position to do that kind of thing. Let's, let's do some comparative regeneration here fish, uh, worms, uh, amphibians. I'm a big believer in comparative biology to try to understand these, these mechanisms. So, yeah, we have a lot to do yet. Yes? Uh, you mentioned uh, the creation of mammoths. Does that imply that we can now uh, claim America? Yes, it does. Um, we probably could, but uh, I think there, <laughs> if I wouldn't want to try to do it because as Beth Shapiro says, um, you know, okay, suppose you, you, you have to get eggs from a female elephant. That would be a big chore in and of itself. <laughs> and then she says, and then she says, the way she puts it is, that I don't think the elephant, the female elephants would like us snooping around in their ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question, I, uh, I've recently heard that, it's get, that you're able to produce uh, uh, stem cells also by carcinogenesis. Yes, that is true, yeah. Um, yeah. How does that relate to what you showed as far as the other this was devised as a way around the bioethical criticisms of um, embryonic stem cell mm -hmm. research because parthenogenetic embryos, at least human embryos, don't survive. Yeah. Uh, so you could study those embryos uh, without you know, people saying, well, you're just being selfish and um, immoral and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, those are haploid embryos, and, and they're triggered. Um, you can trigger them with a, a stimulus to behave as if they were fertilized. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I'm not a biologist, I, 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 but I have been a, a beekeeper at times, uh -huh. and I know yeah. that carcinogenesis has played a lot in the research. Yes, yes. And, and they are very viable. Yeah. What is different that, that makes them viable? Uh, all I can say is we've taken evolutionarily divergent pathways from bees and other kinds of insects that do that. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But tell them about triploid salamanders. Well, yes, you can, you can make triploid salamanders. Uh, salamanders, uh, their eggs are fertilized inside the, the body. They pick up spermatophores of the, uh, the males. And um, you can heat shock the fertilized eggs or cold shock them for that matter as when they're laid. And you prevent one of the polar bodies from forming. That the, the eggs have to go through two what are called meiotic divisions mm -hmm. to get down to the haploid number of chromosomes. So what you do is prevent uh, one of those divisions so that the egg retains a, a diploid number of chromosomes fertilized by the sperm with the haploid number and now you've got triploid, three sets of chromosomes. They're group big cells because they have to accommodate a lot more uh, DNA in the nucleus, but they're nice uh, markers. Uh, if you graft a tissue, you can count um, and you want to know what the origin of something that grows from that graft is, you can count the number of diploid versus triploid cells if you graft from diploid to triploid or triploid to diploid. And it will maintain that triploid.
Yes, it certainly will. Yeah. And it can't use the D. Yeah. Okay. Once it tries to make a U sign, <laughs> it gets confused. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, George Church, I'm not a, uh, really an expert on that particular uh, area, but George Church seems to think that this will not be a problem. The mitochondria always come from the mother, uh, er, and so um, the, the, uh, this creature that he's trying to make would have elephant um, mitochondria. Now. And the question is, are the mitochondria of the elephant any different from that of the mammoth? And I don't know the answer to that question. And maybe Beth Shapiro has answered it in her book. She's answered just about everything else. So that would be the place to look for, for that answer. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, it sh if it's present, it should be present in the developmental process uh, and retained then throughout, throughout life. But what Brox has said is that uh, you only see it in the uridial salamanders. It is not present in frogs. Uh, and so uh, he thinks, it's his idea is that we could be total, all, all of us who are, so gung-ho about being able to re reawaken a regenerative process, we, he says, might be totally wrong. So, yeah, prod one he only finds in uridials in his evolutionary sample. Yes, it would be there in the developing limb, yes. Oh, thank you.